shring ka e i la ring asa ka la ring sa ka la ring sa hoin kling ring shring namaste <laughs> just sitting here goofing around <laughs> getting ready to do this wonderful maha nirvana tantra so what we're going to do is go through the beginning of the first chapter which is pretty much a story and uh, but i want to back up a little bit and say that this maha nirvana tantra describes itself as the dharma for the age of kali kali yuga the age that we're in now and it also describes the age of kali and you'll recognize you know the daily news and you'll also see your life in that <laughs> and then it gives the cure which is the sadhana that reverses all the ills of the age of kali so with that We'll get started. The enchanting summit of the Lord of Mountains, resplendent with all its various jewels, clad with many a tree and many a creeper, melodious with the songs of many birds, scented with the fragrance of all the season's flowers, most beautiful, fanned by soft, cool, and perfumed breezes, shadowed by the still shade of stately trees, where cool groves resound with the sweet-voiced songs of troops of Apsara, and in the forest depths, flocks of Kokila, maddened with passion, sing. Where spring, the lord of the seasons, with his followers, ever abide, the lord of mountains, Kailash, peopled by troops of Siddhas, Charanas, Gandharvas, and Ganapatyas. So now I should explain some of these things. <laughs> the Apsaras are the heavenly dancing girls of Indra. And they especially love to seduce yogis <laughs> who are out in the woods meditating or trying to meditate <laughs> in these beautiful spots. And uh, the Kokila are lovebirds. Coo, coo, coo. Huh? They're sort of like, yeah, I guess the, some people call them cuckoos, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, they're very affectionate with each other. They mate for life. They're very interesting birds. And um, spring is considered the god of all seasons, Vasanta. In India, there are six seasons. And the, so the spring comes like around the end of February. Yeah. And uh, it's a beautiful time of the year. And so there are many, many siddhas. Siddhas are realized beings, human beings. Charanas are beings from the moon planet. Gandharvas are celestial singers and dancers that entertain the demigods. And they, they would come there for, you know, festivals and stuff like that. And the Ganapatya are the elephant tribes. See, elephants are actually intelligent. They're very civilized. Just us stupid human beings can't tell because we don't know consciousness. But uh, elephants are extremely intelligent <laughs> and they, they look at us like we look at dogs and cats, huh? like pets. They, we amuse them with our antics and scampering around. <laughs> but anyway, they're up there too. And if you go in the mountains in India, even today, you find many herds of elephants. So this sets the scene, the mountain of Kailash. And uh, then Parvati approaches Shiva and asks her question. It was there that Parvati, finding Shiva, her gracious Lord, in serene mood, bent low with obeisance. For the benefit of all the worlds, she questioned him, the silent Deva, Lord of all things movable and immovable, the ever beneficent and ever blissful one, the nectar of whose mercy abounds as a great ocean, whose very essence is the pure sattva guna, he who is white as camphor 
and the jasmine flower, the omnipresent one whose raiment is space itself. So who is Lord Shiva? What is Lord Shiva? He is unconditioned awareness. That's why he's always naked. He has no personality, no ego, no desires, no passion. He's pure sattva guna. Huh? In the Bhagavad Gita, the three gunas are described in chapter 13. That mm, the mode of goodness is defined as those activities which lead toward self-realization and liberation. The mode of passion is defined as those selfish activities based on lust that lead to bondage and suffering. And the mode of ignorance, you know, that's, that's the doorway to hell. <laughs> that's the, the gateway to the animal, uh, animal births. So, Lord Shiva then is the personification or the incarnation of the kinds of activity that lead to self-realization. So, his raiment, his dress, his clothes are his space, <laughs> Akash. So it continues describing Lord Shiva. Lord of the poor and the beloved master of all yogis, whose coiled and matted hair is wet with the spray of Ganga and of whose naked body ashes are the only adornment. The passionless one whose neck is garlanded with snakes and skulls of men the three-eyed one, lord of the three worlds, one hand wielding the trident and with the other bestowing blessings, easily appeased, whose very substance is unconditioned knowledge, the bestower of eternal emancipation, the ever-existent, fearless, changeless, stainless one, without defect, the benefactor of all, and the deva of all devas. So, this is a mouthful, huh? What to, where to even begin to describe Lord Shiva? <laughs> when the celestial Ganges sprung from the churning of the ocean of milk so that it would not break the earthly planets, Lord Shiva volunteered to take it on his head. So, the, the celestial Ganges comes down on Shiva's head, where it appears at the base of Mount Kailash as Gangotri, the source of the Ganges. So he wears only ashes, the ashes of the sacrificial fire, not just any ashes, but pure sacred ashes. And his neck is garlanded with snakes. Uh -huh. The other thing that happened at the churning of the ocean of milk is that a great deal of very virulent poison was generated as a byproduct of churning the ocean. And so this was very much dangerous for the whole world. And Shiva, to save the world, he swallowed this poison, but he didn't, he didn't like swallow it all the way. He kept it in his neck. And so consequently, he has a blue line around his neck. And uh, cobras like to, to sit there because okay? they, they like that poison. So his, his neck and shoulders and arms are decorated with cobras and skulls of men. He's no respecter of men, especially the evil, sinful men. The three-eyed one means he's awake. His consciousness is uh, enabled and uh, aroused. And... He holds in one hand the trident, the three shul, the three, well, you've seen it in statues of Neptune. Uh, Neptune is actually Shiva. He holds the, the three shul, trident, which is the three uh, phases of time, past, present, and future. He's easily appeased. <laughs> He's also easily angered. <laughs> so watch out, stay on his good side whose very substance is unconditioned knowledge, just like I said, the bestower of emancipation, ever existent and so on. In other words, he is Brahman. Brahman with a form. And whenever he speaks in the scriptures, Shiva speaks with the voice of Brahman. 
He is the most pure representative of Brahman's point of view, if you will. And so he's also the original guru. Sri Parvati said, O Deva of the Devas, Lord of the world, jewel of mercy, my husband, thou art my Lord, on whom I am ever dependent and to whom I am ever obedient. Nor can I say aught without thy word. If thou hast affection for me, I crave to lay before thee that which passeth in my mind. Who else but thee, O great Lord, in the three worlds, is able to solve these doubts of mine, thou who knowest all and all the scriptures? Wow. What an introduction to a question. It's like, what is she going to ask? Well, let's find out. Sri Sadashiva said, what is that thou sayest, O thou great wise one and beloved of my heart? I will tell thee anything, be it ever so bound in mystery, even that which should not be spoken of before Ganesh and Skanda, commander of the hosts of heaven. What is there in all the three worlds which should be concealed from thee? For thou, O Devi, art my very self. There is no difference between me and thee. Thou too art omnipresent. What is it then that thou knowest not, that thou questionest like unto one who knoweth nothing? <laughs> well, it's because she wants to show by example the proper relationship between husband and wife. This is given at the very beginning of the universe as the Dharma. People are going to have sex, people are going to reproduce, people are going to want to live together and enjoy life and so on, all these things. But there must be a certain arrangement between them, a certain understanding, a certain balance. And my Adi Guru used to compare it to a lame man and a blind man that the lame man can see, but he can't walk. The blind man can walk, but he can't see. So separately, they're very much disabled, but together they make a whole that's more than the sum of its parts. And it's the same thing with man and woman, male and female, yin and yang, uh, light and dark, good and bad, up and down, <laughs> in and out. Everything has its natural complement. Huh? We like to call them opposites, but they're not really opposites because they make each other what they are. So this Dharma has been passed down from the beginning of the universe by the example of Shakti and Shiva, who are one. Huh? They're identical. So but Shiva divides himself into two to show the example of how people should live if they want to be happy. The pure Parvati, gladdened at hearing the words, uh, <coughs> take two. The pure Parvati, gladdened at hearing the words of the Deva, bending low, made obeisance, and thus questioned Shankara. Sri Adya said, O Bhagavan, Lord of all, greatest among those who are versed in Dharma, thou in former ages in thy mercy didst through Brahma reveal the four Vedas, which are the propagators of all Dharma, and which ordain the rules of life for all the various castes of men and for the different stages of their lives. In the first age, men by the practice of Yaga and Yajna prescribed by thee, were virtuous and pleasing to the Devas and Pitras. By the study of the Vedas, Jnana and Tapas, and the conquest of the senses, by acts of mercy and charity, men were of exceeding power and courage, strength and vigor, adherents of the true Dharma, wise and truthful, and of firm resolve. And, mortals though they were, they were yet like Devas and went to the abode of the Devas. 
Kings then were faithful to their engagements and were ever concerned with the protection of their people, upon whose wives they were wont to look as if upon their mothers, and whose children they regarded as their very own. The people, too, did then look upon a neighbor's property as if it were mere lumps of clay, and, with devotion to their dharma, kept to the path of righteousness. There were then no liars, none who were selfish, thievish, malicious, foolish, none who were evil-minded, envious, wrathful, gluttonous, or lustful, but all were good of heart and of ever-blissful mind. Land then yielded in plenty all kinds of grain. Clouds showered seasonal rains, Cows gave abundant milk, and trees were weighted with fruits. No untimely death there was, nor famine, nor sickness. Men were ever cheerful, prosperous, and healthy, and endowed with all qualities of beauty and brilliance. Women were chaste and devoted to their husbands. Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras kept to and followed the customs dharma and yajna of their respective castes, and thereby attained the final liberation. So she's describing the Satya Yuga. And this was the golden age. And this age will come again, but not for a very long time. So in the next episode, we'll discuss the degradation of the dharma in the different yugas, and how it has come down to Kali Yuga. And then she's going to ask her big question. Aung Tat Sat Buddha Sarnai.